leave this. So I'm going to put it on in case I begin to wonder. some thoughts with you this morning about fear. <laughs> I am so out of practice with this that uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing, but I'm going to attach this thing to me and hopefully. Um, I want to share some thoughts with you about fear. Uh, walking on water. How many of you are afraid of water? Anybody fearful of drowning? Uh, maybe some near-death experiences. Have you ever experienced anything that you were fearful of whether or not you were going to live? Maybe a near automobile wreck or something that just terrified you, a situation involving a fire? Uh, are you afraid of heights? Have you experienced something in your life that you thought this was it? I don't know that I'm going to make it through. Fear is a very powerful emotion. It's also one that can motivate us to do things. It can immobilize us. We can become completely immobile because of fear. Uh, it can cripple us into not doing what needs to be done at a particular time. And so the timely factor is removed and we become frozen. And there are numerous examples of that in the scriptures. The scriptures speak continually about fear. And the one scripture that I'm going to refer you to this morning is a situation with Peter as is recorded in the book of Matthew, and Matthew alone records the incident of Peter getting out of a boat and walking on water. Going to meet Jesus. But that was a situation that is most unusual. Uh, contrary to the human element, what we know is something that is uh, not possible. It's not possible to walk on water, no more so than it could be for some bunk, someone to come down the aisle here and never put foot on, on the surface here. There are things that defy human understanding. Um, there are things that terrify us. And I knew a woman some time ago uh, that was fearful of snakes. And this is a reality, so we're not talking about something that is far-fetched. We're talking about fear of snakes. And this is a West African rock python. And this is a little one. This is a little bitty rock python. And Miss Francis, every time that I would use snakes in an illustration or something, she did just terrify me. And it even got to the point where I had to spell S-N-A-K-E. And that didn't pacify She said, Joe, just don't even mention it. Don't even go there. It really did scare her. And sometimes things like this can scare us. Uh, scare us to the point that uh, we become frozen. And we're not able to react in a way that would be beneficial for our safety. I'm going to present a thought to you at the conclusion of the lesson in just a few minutes about the snake and what can happen. And to keep in mind that uh, the whole thing that we're talking about here is that fear and what it can do to us. The scriptures that are used in the New Testament are taken from Matthew the 14th chapter and also from Mark and John's account in 
both of those books in the sixth chapter. Uh, I remember as a kid, though, experiencing things that had to do with this time of the year, ghosts, and how afraid I would get, the fear that would come over me in situations that involved horror stories. And I can remember camping out and gathering around campfires in the evening and us telling ghost stories. I never really cared for that. I didn't like to go to horror movies. Some people do. Some people get an excitement over things like that. I did not. They terrified me. My father-in-law told the story about some of the boys in the town where he lived up in West Virginia trying to bribe him with money to go spend the night at a haunted house up in the woods. And he thought that the money that they were offering was a justifiable reason for him to take that on. And so he accepted the offer as a young kid. And he got his sleeping bag and his pillow and some comic books and things like that and trekked off through the woods going up an old logging road to a haunted house to spend the night. And he built a fire in the fireplace and made himself comfortable and began to read some of his comic books by firelight. And as he is sitting there, as he tells the story, as he's sitting there, he hears a creaking noise on the staircase. And it gets louder and closer. And so finally, he turns around to look and see what's going on. And there, sure enough, is a ghost. But he was not frozen with fear. Fear motivated him. And he jumped up and took off running out the front door of the building and ran just as fast and as hard as he could for as long as he could until he was completely winded. Going down this old logging road at night, he finally saw a log and sat down on the log and he's sitting there breathing heavily and he feels something sitting down beside him. And all of a sudden this boy says, that was some race we had, wasn't it? And my father-in-law says, yes, but it was nothing like the one we're fixing to have. <laughs> fear can motivate you, and fear can cause you to freeze. Unfortunately, as a motivating force, sometimes we are frozen right where we are. We're just afraid to get out of the shell and to open up and to express to people the feelings that we have and to share with others our faith and our belief. Three accounts. If you're taking Bible, we turn over to Matthew, the 14th chapter. We're going to look at that one first because I think that it is the one that I'm going to use for the basis of our lesson for just a few minutes this morning. Matthew chapter 14. Begins with the 14th verse. And I'll read through it, and you can follow along with me, or if you've got your Bible over there, you can follow it there. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And after he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already well out onto the sea, battered by waves, and the wind was contrary to them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the water. And when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were frightened. They were afraid. They were fearful. And they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage. In his eyes, don't be afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. That's a bold statement, isn't it? And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became afraid and began to sink. And he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. And said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And listen to the rest of it. And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. 
They didn't always say that. There were things that were part of their lives that hindered them from recognizing Jesus as the Son of God. This was not always the thought that they had. In fact, some of the accounts that are given here are somewhat mystifying. As we look at, you know, these three scriptures, as Matthew we've just looked at, and the way that Mark records it, and also the way that John records it, it kind of makes you wonder about where were the disciples at this time? What was in their mind? What were they thinking? Is there the possibility that they were frozen in fear and uncertainty of what the future held? Or maybe they had a complete misconception of what all of this that Jesus was teaching was about. The three accounts of Jesus walking on the water as presented in the scriptures, the gospel accounts of Matthew and of Mark and of John, are not just single solitary events that need to be looked at by themselves. In fact, each one of these events, the record that is given there in the gospels, follows, each one of them, the feeding of 5,000 people. Each one of them. Go back to Matthew's account here in the 14th chapter. Let's notice something real quickly. Matthew chapter 14. The account that is presented here is that toward the end of the 20th verse, it says, after Jesus has fed all of these people miraculously, with what? Two and five. Two fish, five loaves. Notice how Matthew presents this. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve full baskets. And there were about 5,000 men who ate. Aside, that's not counting women and children. Now I want you to get the, the gravity of this situation. He's not feeding just 5,000 people. And you know, if we could put 500 people in this building, it would be 10 times more. But that's not counting the women and children. There's the possibility that what he was feeding was 10, 15,000 people. Miraculously feeding them with two fish and five loaves. The miracle of feeding that many people is incredible. That's a phenomenal event. And I keep wondering, because of the things that the disciples said, and, and of him walking on the water, and, uh, and, and uh, afraid, and, and we've got reservations about all of this, and wow, just now we're beginning to see that you are surely God's son. Where was their mind? What was going on with them in all of this time? Where were they, where were they when the, the miracle of feeding all these people was taking place? Well, they were there. They were a part of it. It does puzzle me. Turn to John and look at the sixth chapter. Let's notice verses 14 15. John chapter 6. Verse 14 and 15. The people have seen something and it strikes a chord with them. And so they gathered them up, filled twelve baskets of fragments from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Verse 14. And when therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is of a truth, the prophet who has come into the world. Verse 15. And Jesus, therefore, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. The people see something that maybe the apostles did not see. The people see Jesus as the possible answer for what they were wanting. The establishment of a new kingdom, the kingdom of David. These people are ready to take him and to make him their king. But his immediate disciples weren't there. They, 
they were there, but they weren't there. They had not moved to that point. These people are wanting to make him a king. Let's have a revolt. Let's have a coup d'etat. Let's have a rebellion. Let's have a revolution and establish Jesus as our king. This is what the people wanted. And this came as a result of the miracles that they saw of Jesus feeding these thousands of people. They wanted somebody that was going to do for them something that the Herodians could not and something that the Romans could not to establish Jesus as their king. They knew that he could not only heal their bodies, that he could take care of the diseases that they would have, that he could raise the dead, but they also recognized in this miracle that was being performed that he also was a source of a permanent food supply. And so this is what they wanted. But the problem was, they were wanting only physical things. They wanted things that were for the moment. They wanted things that were temporal. And they were thinking of a welfare state and a newfound system of entitlement that was going to take care of all the physical needs that they had. But you know what? They're not really different from us. They're, they're not far afield from where we are and the way that we think. But Jesus had absolutely no plans for that whatsoever. His revolution was of the heart and the mind and the soul. It had absolutely nothing to do with the physical needs of this life. And the miracles that he performed not only were misinterpreted by the masses, but they were misinterpreted by his own followers, by those that were closest to him. And sometimes we become very secure in our own position in our view of salvation. But Jesus was saying, as John records, in a rather lengthy statement there in John the 6th chapter, verses 22 through 59, Jesus is saying basically, I am not here for the purpose that you have intended. The miracle that I performed, that's not why I was here. I'm not here to take care of all of your physical needs. I'm not here to provide for you what you desire of food and clothing and shelter, of all of those things. That's not why I'm here. And John chapter 6, verse 66 gives us an indication of how this was received. Because it says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Now, look with me at Mark. And we're going to go to the 6th chapter there and read uh, the thought that is presented with regards to his disciples. <coughs> Mark chapter 6, and we'll notice verses 45 through 52. Matthew 6, 45 through 52. <coughs> And immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending the multitude away. The miracle of feeding the thousands had taken place. He's now telling his disciples, get in the boat, go to the other side of the, of the lake. And after bidding them farewell, he departed to the mountain to pray. And when it was evening, the boat was in the midst of the sea, and he was alone on land. And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, it was about the fourth watch of the night. That would have been 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. He came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost and they cried out, for they all saw him and were frightened. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped. 
Now these were his disciples. Now notice verse 52. They were greatly astonished, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. But their heart was hardened. Isn't that bizarre? Does that strike you as being odd? I'm not trying to disparage the disciples. I'm trying to show you human weakness. <coughs> human frailty of the inability that we have of putting things together and seeing the full picture. It's a part of who we are. It's a part of the human element. We do not always see things as they are, as they truly are. And sometimes we can come to a judgment about things that's totally erroneous. And he says to them, I didn't come here for the purpose of providing physically all the things that you want. Why do you suppose their heart was hardened? As Mark gives us the record of this, I believe that it's the truth. They had just witnessed the feeding of thousands and thousands of people. Miraculously witnessed that. But it apparently it, it didn't register. But he comes walking to them on water. And it's finally then that they recognize him as the Son of God. Have you ever in a situation like that? Where you just really don't see things? And if I had known, why didn't I see that? How did I miss that? You ever, those little cliches ever captured you? What must I have been thinking? Do you see that they're human? That they're like us, or we're like them? Of human frailty and weaknesses? Their thought was that Jesus was going to come into a kingdom that was like David. He was going to establish an earthly kingdom. Oh, they wanted position and power. I want to be on your right side. I want to be on your left side. When you come into your kingdom, we want royalty. We want position. We want status. We want to be looked at as people of prominence. And he kept telling them, look, how long have I been with you? You are just not getting it. And we're just like them. We're like Peter. We take our eyes off of Jesus and we get so corrupted by the world. And I'm not trying to find fault with, with all of us. I'm just saying, there are things that we do get pulled away from. We lose our focus. We become fearful. We worry about things such as our health and loneliness and job security, our 401k and North Korea and Iran and terrorists and mass murders. We feed on these things from the news. And what Jesus is saying, look, you're looking at the wrong thing. Your focus is on the wrong thing. I did not come for you to focus on that. Don't get carried away with all this garbage that is going on in the world. And it's been going on for a long time. The things that we see happening on the news, this is nothing new. There is nothing new under the sun. They had this stuff going on thousands of years ago. But the message that was given by Jesus then is don't focus on that. If you take your sight off of me, you will be consumed by the world. It will eat you up. It will devour you. Here's the sad reality. Peter gets out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. But what happens? He takes his eyes off of Jesus. <coughs> he sees all this stuff around him and he begins to sink. You ever get that sinking feeling? You get distracted, you lose your focus. And things just start going awry. 
Things don't work the way that they did when your focus was direct right on. And you knew exactly where you were going and you knew what you were going to do. Do you think for a moment that Satan is going to give up on you because you're sitting in the pew this morning? Really? As people like to say today, seriously? You think he's going to give up on you? No way. No way. You are in Satan's crosshairs. He is after you. More so after you because you're here. He's not worried about people out here in the, you know, the apartments or out jogging or whatever they're doing. And they have absolutely zero focus on the kingdom of God. He's not worried about them. Why? Why are you worried about them? Why are you after them? He's already got them. He's got them. He doesn't have you. He's going to work on you. And he's going to work on you in some of the most sinister ways you cannot even imagine. But if he worked on the Lord's disciples, don't think for a moment that he won't work on you. And they were the ones that had the closest proximity to our Lord and Savior. And they didn't get it. They were just like them. No difference. We read Matthew's account, we read about humanity. We read Mark's account, we read about humanity. We read John's account, we read about humanity. And that's us. That's us. In all of our shortcomings and weaknesses and frailties, we lose focus because we get consumed by the world. And the glitter that is in the world, you know who that glitter is from, don't you? And all that glitters is not gold, but Satan would have you believe that it is and get you to buy into it. Distractions, loss of focus, complacency, they're close at hand for the children of God. And if you don't think they're not, look at the sinister situation of Genesis chapter 3. And he said to him, there is not anything in the world wrong with you eating that. You will not die. And you know what she was wanting? Do you know what he wanted? Something evil? Something wicked? Something terrible? No. Here's what it was. Eve wanted to be wise. You see how sinister Satan is? If, if you eat that, you will be as wise as God, knowing good and evil. If you will eat that Eve, I'll tell you what, you'll be able to walk on water. And she ate it. Did she walk on water? Was she able to walk on water? Not at all. If you lose sight of the kingdom of God, you have lost sight of the most precious thing that you have, of the promise that has been made of life eternal. I had gone into a village in the Gambia, Parababanta. We had Bible correspondence courses going on there. I walked into the village one day. And there was nobody there except one elderly man. And I said, where is everybody? He says, Sabon Labat, Satan over there. So I take off over there. And here's the 200 people in the village. And they're all out there in the bush. Because one of the men had a little garden plot out in the bush. And as he was going along with his dog to his garden plot, 25 foot West African rock pipe laying in stealth hidden in the brush grabbed his dog bit his dog wrapped himself around him and started choking him 
and choke him. And the man takes off running because this is his dog. Runs to the village because in the village there was a person with a shotgun. And he calls to the village about, somebody come help me free my dog from the snake. And so the whole village comes out there and they kill the snake. But the snake had already killed the dog. They hunt maybe once a month. And then they lie and wait. Sinister. Stealth. Camouflage perfectly to blend in with their surroundings. And that snake reached up and grabbed that dog, bit him, and held him, and wrapped himself around him, and choked life right out of him. And the dog never knew the snake was there. The point of the lesson even with the miracles. Those that were closest to our Lord didn't see who He was. If their concept, if their focus, if their direction can go off, so can you. We're all in that predicament. Satan is, oh, he seeks to destroy us, and he will use every means available to grab you, and to devour you, and to kill you, and to separate you from the love of God, which we have, all of us have, in Christ Jesus. Forgiveness of sins, salvation, deliverance from that which will destroy you. You're having trouble with some things in life? you got some crud going on in your life? you got an army of people here that are willing to help you to support you. We're to be comfort and strength one to another. That's why he gives us arms and legs and eyes and ears, not individually. That's what all of us are for each other. A support system. The Corpus Christi. Christos. The body of Christ. That's us. We're his arms, his leg. If you have a problem, we're here to lean on one another. If you've never come into the body of Christ, oh boy, he's after you. He may already have you. You may be so frozen that you wouldn't even do what is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And God says, this is my son. You believe in him. He is the way to life eternal. It is through him that you will have forgiveness of sins. You must come to me through Him. But, here's the condition. You've got to die. You've got to die. What? Yeah, you've got to die. To yourself. You die to self. You and from Jesus Christ. Getting you out of the way. You and from Jesus Christ. As Lord of your life. The greatest focus that you can have on this side of eternity is Jesus Christ. But the Hebrew, Yeshua Mashiach. Yeshua Mashiach. The Lord saves the Messiah. Joshua Messiah, Yeshua, Messiah. That is salvation from Jesus Christ. And if you're willing to enthrone Him as Lord, you will do whatever He tells you to do. And what He's telling you to do is this. And if you haven't done it, you're in a precarious situation. And He says you must die to yourself, you must be buried, and I will see that you are resurrected, newborn in Christ Jesus. We call it baptism. Powerful symbolism that is used there. Death, burial, resurrection. Just as Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. We died, were buried, and resurrected. It is through the water grave. God's plan, not mine. I didn't invent it. It's God's plan. From the foundation of the world. 
we can assist, help you in any way, <coughs> don't wait. Don't tarry. Don't put it off. Satan seeks to devour you, but God's grace and love is greater than any sin that you can commit. And forgiveness is available to you. Would you come? Just stand.